Hello, this is Russell Moore, and you're listening to The Russell Moore Show, brought to you by the Public Theology Project at Christianity Today. Every week here, we explore conversations and questions from a Christian perspective. And today, I want to talk about something that has concerned me uh, and, and made me curious for many, many years, but almost no one talks about. And um, that's graveyards, cremation, uh, the, the question of uh, what happens at death, not meaning what happens eternally uh, to the person after death, but what happens in the days after death, how we treat the dead, how we deal with the dead. I think that's one of the most interesting questions right now, not in terms of you know, who's wrong, who's right and who's wrong and, and what's moral and what's immoral about our funeral practices as much as what has changed and why in ways that we haven't even looked at or, or recognized. And uh, one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this today is there's an article in the Washington Post last month looking at the stunning rise of cremation. And uh, the, the, the headline says, this reveals America's changing idea of death, reporting that 56 a percent of Americans uh, who died in 2020 were cremated. That's a stunning reversal of what uh, of what previously would have been the case, with projections that by 2040, four out of five people will be cremated. And the article explored uh, some of the reasons why. Some of it is uh, is uh, environmental factors. People uh, find it to be greener uh, sometimes to to cremate, although that's uh, disputed. Some of it's economic. Uh, it's, it's just cheaper to do this in many cases. But some of it, the article says, is an increasingly secular, transient, and some argue death phobic nation. Quoting Thomas Lynch, the poet, slash funeral director. He has to be the only one. I say this every time I talk about this. He has to be the only poet slash funeral director that I know of, but he is one. And he says, people want the body disappeared because they don't want to be reminded of the grief. And this is the first generation of our species that deals with death without dealing with the dead. And uh, this is something I've been noticing happening for for some time. Um, for instance, there was an article, oh, I don't know, it has to be 20 years ago, about uh, a, a woman who wanted to be cremated and put in a Tasmanian devil cookie jar because she liked the imagery of the the in frenetic energy of the Tasmanian devil and uh, your your dad you know, there, there is no frenetic energy going on at least with your your body uh, at that point but she liked the imagery something's happening here and I was immediately reminded of someone who is uh, even before I had gotten to the point where he was quoted in the article, I kept thinking about uh, his work on this, his uh, research in a book from several years ago called Purified by Fire, which is a uh, history of cremation in America. It's somebody that I read no matter what he writes, uh, because it's always fascinating and thought provoking. Uh, Professor Stephen Prothero at Boston University, who has written uh, such books as God is Not One, uh, American Jesus might have been the first uh, of his books that I read many, many uh, years ago, uh, Why Liberals Always Win the Culture Wars, um, uh, several, several uh, books. But he wrote this on cremation. Uh, he's uh, he's uh, one of the, the foremost experts in the United States on the study of religion uh, and sociology of religion. And Professor Prother, welcome to the Russell Moore Show. Thanks for doing this. Thanks for having me. It's always fun to talk with you. You mention uh, in the article that you were wrong uh, in, in your book in terms I love of how you uh, just your start. You just start right yeah. in. <laughs> you just start start right in. in. <laughs> but but you were wrong in a way that that um, th that actually means you were righter than you knew in, in the sense that you did not expect the velocity of the change in the United States when it comes to this this move from a, a burial, uh, embalming, sort of traditional funeral home type of, uh, of death to cremation. Uh, is that right? This, this has actually happened. Not that the, you weren't wrong about the direction it was going in, but you were wrong about how quickly it would get there. Yeah, that's a nice way to put it in terms of the velocity. And, you know, one observation that I made in the book and also uh, with the the um, author of the Washington Post article uh, is that 
humans do a lot of different rituals, right? I mean, we have birth rituals, we have marriage rituals, we have, you know, house naming rituals. You know, we have, we have a bunch of rituals. It's something humans do. But of all the rituals we do, the ones that are most stable are death rituals. And there, you know, there's a lot of theories about why that is, but they just don't tend to change. So even as this culture is changing, people who are dissenting or people who are countercultural, they still tend to go back at death. They tend to go back to the comforts of tradition. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so to see the cremation rate move from a little under 4% in 1963 to a little over 25%. When I wrote my book 20 years ago now, um, in 2001, it was 27%, 26, 27%. I thought that was an astonishing move. Um, and now, as you say, we're over half. You know, it's, it's the most common way to uh, do the disposition of the dead in the United States now. And... That's extraordinary when you think about how many Christians there are in the United States and how closely connected Christianity is to the resurrection of the body and to the burial tradition um, alongside Judaism and, and Islam, of course. And uh, there's a lot going on under the, under the surface here. <laughs> But before we get, I want, I want to talk about that question of, of religion, but before we get there, I'm curious, how much of this do you think is bound up? You mentioned rituals around uh, marriage and birth and, and so forth. If you look at, um, I mean, weddings have changed rather dramatically uh, over the last uh, over the last several years in terms of uh, sort of the standard Book of Common Prayer uh, Protestant uh, service that, that one would see in, in those circles to couples writing their own vows. Birth rituals have changed. Uh, gender reveal parties, um, not anything that would have been going on 30 years ago and now is uh, very common. How much of, of this change when it comes to death is just mixed up with that, with, with just sort of uh, rituals changing very rapidly yeah. now? Yeah, so I think that's part of it. And, and in the book, I write about that as the customization of culture, that, mm. that we um, increasingly want to uh, assert our individual identity and our uniqueness even uh, in all kinds of ways. And one of them is by having a unique ritual, like who wants, who wants the Book of Common Prayer? By the way, can it, can it, can it be written any better? Like, I mean, really, no. I mean, <laughs> really, um, yeah. but, but who wants that for a wedding or who wants that for, um, a funeral? You know, you want to write your own thing. I always, <laughs> I tell my students sometimes, just be really careful about writing your own vows because you might be really, really, really embarrassed by them. If you, if you go back and see a video when you're 35 years old, you know, yeah. but I do think, I do think that. This is part of a much broader uh, move away from traditional authority, away from the authority of the priest, away from the authority of the minister, away from the authority of the church and the synagogue, um, away from the authority of the president, away from the authority of the Supreme Court, like wh whatever it might be. Americans um, have a kind of, in our DNA, a sort of mistrust for authority, right? We start with a revolution against a king, but um, that's really accelerated, I think, with the rise of consumer culture, consumer capitalism, where, you know, we go in the store and we assert, you know, who we are by what sodas we buy, you know, and, and, and uh, so I think that's definitely going on. And I think to tie it with gender reveal parties and writing your own vows is exactly right that people, this, you know, how do you bury, you know, the traditional thing is you go to a church, the minister says something, and then you go to a cemetery, the minister says something, and then you go on the ground. Um, but part of the attraction of cremation historically has been that we don't really know how to ritualize it, right? Certainly when it starts in the late 19th century, um, in, in my book, I write about the very first one. Nobody, they're all improvising. They have no idea how to do, yeah. what, what do we do? Like they know it has to be ritualized, but they're sort of, they're sort of making it up as they go along. So the fact that in the United States, we don't have for the most part, except for inside, you know, Buddhist Hindu communities who do have traditions, we mostly don't have traditions. So we get to make them up. And so it feels like anything can happen day 
It feels mm-hmm. like we can customize to our heart's delight rather than feeling constrained by, oh, no, this is how it's always this is how it's always been done. So I think that is a big part of, of the, I know uh, a, a family where the the father of the family died and left in his will. You can do a funeral in a wake in a traditional way, or you can cremate me. And if you cremate me, you can put my ashes in the ocean, or you can put my ashes in my hometown, or you can put my ashes. He gave these several options, which the family took as all of the above. So there was a traditional uh, embalming oh, wake funeral. God. Then there was a cremation. And I think last I heard, they are still having ceremonies. And it's been probably five years of, of putting different parts of uh, this person's ashes all over uh, all over the place because they don't know what to do and uh, don't, don't want to disappoint it. Yeah. And that's one of the that's one of the allures of cremation is that the body becomes uh, divisible. Right? Yeah. And yeah. when I talk to my students, I teach a class called Death and Immortality. When I talk with them, I say, you know, now in theory, a body, a, you know, an uncremated body is divisible. I mean, in theory, you could chop off the arm and give it to your cousin and you could chop off your leg and give it to someone else to bury. Um, but no, 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 no one's going to yeah. do that, uh, hopefully. But um, with cremated remains, you can say, well, you know, he really loved Cape Cod but he really loved New York City where he lived in the winter. And so let's scatter. Or he really had a, a football team he loved and a, and a baseball team he loved. So let's put some in Fenway Park and let's, you know, put some in, you know, Foxborough Stadium or whatever. Um, whatever yeah. And there, I mean, Disney World has had to come up yes. with regulations to prevent people from from scattering remains there. Yeah. And Major League Ballparks are very popular, too. Um, yeah. And I even think the National Park Service has has regulations uh, against um, scattering cremated remains, which is kind of odd because there's so much land there. But, um, mm. but yeah. You know, in uh, Leon Cass's uh, commentary on Exodus, his, his uh, Founding God's Nation book on, on Exodus, he has a really, I think, brilliant uh, section on um, the Exodus account in which Moses is carrying Joseph's bones. Um, out of Egypt and and into uh, the land of promise, which of course is how Genesis ends, is with that commitment that that Joseph is receiving from his brothers. You will carry my bones from here. Moses does that. It's mentioned in the New Testament in the book of Hebrews as an act of faith. One of the things that um, that Cass points out is that you have this irony of Moses, who is uh, an Israelite by birth, but who had been an Egyptian. Uh, in, in every way, carrying someone who had um, had had uh, grown up as an Israelite, but then became an Egyptian uh, in in many ways, and that this was among other things the rejection of an Egyptian view of death, uh, with the embalming of the body, the the pyramid, uh, the, the the desire for youth seen in the shaving of, um, of the hair and, the, and, and body hair and so forth, that Joseph is reclaiming uh, an Israelite uh, covenantal understanding of death rather than an Egyptian understanding of death. I was thinking as I was reading that about when you mention in uh, Purified by Fire, how what we do with death is a story. This is, this is narrating something. And so you you end up with the drama, as you put it, of a collective rising from the dead uh, being replaced with a drama that that climaxes with the individual uh, person. What happens to the individual person is that is the changing of that drama why we, for instance, never see. I mean, you can see new churches being constructed all over the place. No one is constructing a new church plant with a church graveyard. I mean, I, I think there are there are zoning reasons for some of that, but the, the, but it's not it's not that people are being prevented by the zoning boards from doing this. It it usually doesn't enter people's minds. Is yeah. the is the narrative there part of what's happening? Yes, it's such a good question. I have so many so many responses. I mean, just to go back to Moses, you know, one thing about Moses is unique among the patriarchs. Um, he is not buried by his kin. He is buried mm-hmm. by God. And we do not know the place to this day where he is buried, the Bible says, mm-hmm. right? 
Um, and so that is also a, um, a critique of the Egyptian thing, right? Because the Egyptian thing is, is the big burial with the pyramid and what, what the, the biblical text there is telling us, I think is we, this is, you know, we're monotheists. We, we're not setting up humans, even Moses, even Moses, mm. we're not setting up to be worshiped. And because maybe he's the most likely to be worshiped, he is, we don't know where he is. We don't know mm. where he is buried. So there's a story there. There's a story of the, the power of monotheism, the danger of the apotheosis of the human in the Hebrew, um, you know, Israelite, you know, uh, Hebrew Bible mind. Uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I think in terms of the story going from the collective, I mean, this happens with the resurrection of the body too, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the classic Christian story is you're buried and you wait, right? I mean, the, the human is a body and a soul, the body and the soul separate mm -hmm. and the body goes in the ground and the soul goes somewhere. And then at the end of times, when Jesus comes back, we have a general re resurrection. It's everybody out, everybody out. Mm -hmm. um, and then the judgment, I mean, there, there's time issues, you know, all that, you know, when things are happening exactly. But, but there isn't the idea that it's instant story of you going to heaven until sometime in the early modern period or the modern period. I mean, so, so that, that's to me is a really interesting, uh, tension in the Christian, um, in, in the history of Christianity is sort of how that plays out. And I think, um, so there's a, so, so you don't, in other words, you don't have to move to cremation to get that individual, the story becoming individual rather than collective, right? I mean, I think that's part of what happens when we move from Judaism to Christianity is that it does become more of an individual, um, individual drama, but cremation certainly, um, accelerates that. Uh, I think the key thing is that in cremation, the body is not part of the human. And mm -hmm. I mean, in the cremation cultures, in Buddhism and Hinduism, in, in ancient Greek, you know, time of Socrates and Plato, uh, the human is a soul. The human is a spirit. It's a, it's descetic to use, you know, Christian, Christian language, right? It's mm -hmm. the body, the body, you know, um, Jesus only seemed to be a person, that early Christian, um, heresy, um, that is the cremation idea. And I think part of what's happening in the U.S. is that that idea of the human is becoming uh, more powerful, even among Christians who are increasingly believing in reincarnation, for example, and who are increasingly seeing the self as somehow disembodied. Um, I think that's another big part of the cultural and religious and theological side of the uh, rise of cremation. You know, one of the things, and this is going back, I mean, I think the first time I wrote about this was over 20 years ago. And uh, when one talks about changing uh, views of the resurrection of the body and why cremation has always been uh, assumed in, in uh, some other religious context and not in a Christian context, immediately what people assume that uh, that is being argued is that, well, if someone's cremated, they're not going to be resurrected from the dead, uh, which uh, I've always said is that that has nothing to do with what we're arguing. Someone who's cremated is resurrected from the dead. Someone who is tossed over uh, overboard uh, from a pirate ship uh, is resurrected from the dead. The question is uh, what we're what story we're telling, what sign we're giving to one another with the carrying of the body. Uh, in a way that for Christians, the, the anointing of Jesus, the carrying of Jesus's body uh, by Mary and the women in the three days, um, this was something that was seen as an act of reverence and an act of, uh, and an act of love. So it's, it's not a question of whether or not the person is doing something morally wrong or whether the person is consigning their loved one to... Um, to, to, to not uh, receiving eternal life. It's nothing like that. It's a question of what are the, what are the assumptions that we're sort of taking on without having debated them in a church council or on Facebook or, or anywhere else? And one of the things when you mentioned um, these stories of individualism and, uh, and collective identity, it, the Book of Common Prayer um, a sort of service, I think, 
joins the best aspects of a communal and an individual identity at its best because there is um, a eulogy, a, a recognition. Some religious traditions don't do eulogies at all, but there is that recognition of this was a this was a unique person. There's no one like uh, John. This is what his life was. And there is this sameness where at my father preaching my father's funeral a year and a half ago, um, there's something really powerful about standing at the graveside with the exact same liturgy I experienced with my grandfather's death, knowing that this is the exact same liturgy that will be said over my grave, that that connectivity. Uh, don't don't you think that that part of what's happening is that we have it's not just that we've moved from community to individual it's that we've pitted community and individual as either or i'm either completely a part of my tribe and, and i think like my tribe and do like my tribe or i'm i have to pretend to be completely individual and disconnected yeah. i think we've really lost something with that when yeah, it comes to I our rituals right. And I think, um, you know, part of the part of the accommodation that happens as we move from the medieval to the early modern to the modern period is that, you know, there didn't used to be eulogies for the most part in the Christian mm -hmm. world um, in the mid in the Middle Ages. And there didn't if you look at uh, tombstones, um, they're just giving a name, a name and a date like it's the, the, there isn't really a story to be told about an individual. Mm -hmm. And, the, and what happens at a funeral is one is reminded that you're going to die. And one is reminded that the church um, affirms the resurrection of the body and that your body will be raised and Jesus's body was raised and there will be a judgment and all that kind of stuff. And so it doesn't really matter who died. But I think as we move into the modern period and we have more of this idea of a personal relationship with Jesus and more of this idea of each individual is uniquely created in the image of God not sort of, you know, rubber stamped created in the image of God. Um, then we start to see on, on, you know, in graveyards and grave markers and in, you know, the rise of memoir, the rise of autobiography, the rise of biography, all these things mm -hmm. where the individual, the person, the personality is thought to have agency, um, thought to be able to make choices, um, all that kind of stuff. And that really gets um, gets accented. And I think that's part of the tension, as you point out, with what to do, you know, with a corpse, like to what extent is, you know, my, my dad died four years ago and a similar thing, like how much are you honoring him and how much are you reciting from, you know, in our case as well, the Book of Common Prayer um, in the Episcopal tradition. Uh, and, uh, and and I agree, there's, there's certainly ways to read uh, the notion of the incarnation, um, not to get, I mean, I'm not a theologian, so I, I should, I should abstain from this, <laughs> from this futile effort. But I mean, I, I do, you know, personally, I do think that the idea of, of the incarnation, you know, hallows the, you know, hallows, you know, the human body. And, and I think when, when Thomas Lynch is being critical about, you know, we just now, we just kind of want to we're doing death without the corpse, you know, I think that's part of what, part of what he's doing too is, you know, hallowing of the, of the human body. Do you think that this is good? When we look around at some of the technological changes, um, the metaverse, uh, the, the, those sorts of uh, concepts, which if you talk about them too much, you can't really do that without most people thinking it sounds science fiction-y and unrealistic, but, so would iPhones have, have seemed uh, or the Internet have seemed uh, before they, they came about. Uh, do you think that that's going to accelerate this sense of separating my sense of self from body uh, to, to where I, I can imagine the sort of world where uh, most of us are sedentary in terms of our bodily life and and lonely and disconnected in terms of our bodily life, but super connected uh, in, in this sort of digital uh, world. Do you think that's going to contribute to the way that we see death? Yes, I do. And, and I think it, it will accelerate, like you said, the sense of the, the person, and not just as death, but the sense of the human being. You know, mm -hmm. what is a human being? A human being there is a mind, right? Mm -hmm. Is it a mind with fingers on a typewriter or or hands on a joystick. Um, 
playing, you know, video games or engaging with other avatars, you know, in the metaverse. Um, I think, and I think I would also argue that, that those, uh, scientific innovations like the metaverse aren't possible without the notion that the human is a mind or a soul or a spirit essentially disembodied. Mm -hmm. I don't think we would have come up with these ideas, um, or with these inventions without that notion of the disembodied human person. And, um, and this is, I think a challenge to Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, which have always understood the human to be a body and a soul, both. I think that's mm -hmm. one of the, the innovations of those traditions and one of the distinctive features of them that I think that's, I think that's part of where we get, you know, um, Jesus's blessing of the weak and the poor and the, the concern about suffering and concern about, um, sickness, uh, you know, because that is, that is me like that, that is, that is not just like one of my thousand bodies I will move through over the course of my many incarnations as it is in, in the Hindu tradition, but it is somehow uniquely Stephen Prothero's uh, one and only body and that we should, we should care. If we care about him, then we should care about his body as much as we care about uh, his, his mind. If you listen to some of the more radical uh, transhumanists and techno utopian people, there's there's often conversation about uploading uh, the person uh, into um, a, a computer program, which, of course, has that assumption that if you get the brain patterns, that's you. You, you, yes. you have the, the content uh, of that. Yes. And it, it reminds me of uh, I have a friend who was uh, talking about many years ago being in a in a theology class where the professor stood up and he had a bunch of syllogisms uh, on the on the whiteboard or the blackboard or whatever it was and said, that's God. And uh, th this this person said that you, you can't you can't encapsulate God in a list of syllogisms on a, and say that is God. Uh, it, it does seem that that something has happened where not the question of whether or not you can upload uh, a, a person. And but the very fact that that's the question being asked shows us something's different about how we see each other. Yeah. And, you know, my analysis of this is that. Is that the, you know, I, in my my death and immortality class? I I talk about five models for how people think about death and immortality and act toward it, and and the models are sort of derived from three questions. You know, what is a human being? What do you do with a corpse? And what happens when we die? And mm. and I argue that the way we answer those questions about personhood, about disposition of the dead, and about the afterlife, those tend in civilizations to be coherent. You know, mm -hmm. like the, the person m transmigrates from life to life and is essentially spiritual. So when they die, we burn their corpse. And as we burn their corpse, we speed them on to their, their next life. Like that's, that's a story that makes sense. You know, the human, um, the human is a combo of body and, and soul as Jesus was. Um, and when we die, those two separate, but we safeguard underground the body because at the end of times it will come out and it will be reunited with the soul and it will have an eternal it will have an, et an eternal life that's also coherent you know it's it's coherent sense idea of the person idea of the afterlife um, idea of the disposition of the dead and i think what's happening in the united states is not only that fewer people are identifying as christian and fewer more people are identifying as nuns and -O -N -E -S, like people who don't have religious identification and and that is driving cremation upward but so is the sort of inner hinduization of the christian uh church in the united states like the in, inner um sense of like filling that model which i call the ascetic model which is hindu and ancient greek and and to some extent buddhist that the human is essentially essentially spiritual essentially um uh, and the body is external to the person um, and I think that is, is a, a huge, and, and you, and you can find this in like how many people believe in reincarnation, you know, it's something around 30%. It used to track nicely the cremation rate. I sort of enjoyed that as I would watch the, mm. the belief in reincarnation go 15, 20, 25. They were sort of tracking each other. 
Um, now, you know, cremation is above 50. Reincarnation belief is around 33. But still, um, I think that there's, there's a correlation there that may be, may be causal in some ways, too. How much of this do you think is driven by, if we look back at the, the old book, um, The American Way of Death, um, uh, Mitford, I, I believe. Was, yeah, Jessica uh, Mitford, yeah. Yes, yeah, Jessica Mitford. Uh, how much of this is, if you look at, even before we get to cremation, there's such a shift in terms of even the, the uh, regular patterns of uh, burial, even just in my lifetime, it, at a funeral when I was a kid or a teenager, almost always this was going to be happening in my home church or a church uh, down the road. And everybody was going to end up in the, the Woolmarket Cemetery uh, there in my uh, community. Uh, now, the, increasingly, it is really, really rare to, to go to a funeral in a church. And when I do, it's because I know that this is someone who specifically made clear that he or she wanted uh, the funeral to be in a church. It's usually in a generic kind of chapel in a, in a funeral home. Usually the, the pastor, if there's a pastor involved, is there. But it's really being run by the funeral directors. Um, there. How much of this sort of uh, shift toward multiple options is really coming in reaction to that, of people saying, this seems like a racket to me, yeah. or it seems antiseptic to me? Yeah. So the Jessica Midford thing was really consumer driven, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it, it was, uh, I mean, it was anti-capitalist. She was a, she was a anti-capitalist, but it was also consumer revolution driven that like, where are these prices coming from? Well, why do we have to buy the whole, why do we have to buy the casket and all the stuff with it? Like, can't we just pick, can't we like mm -hmm. pick and choose what we're, what we're buying? Um, and, and her thing was the traditional funeral is not traditional. Like the traditional funeral is an invention, post-Civil War invention of making death an, an industry. And she's right about that, by the way. I mean, before the Civil War, we didn't have business, for-profit businesses that, you know, people were buried in their hometowns and people were mostly living in home in towns mm -hmm. and they were carried physically by their friends and family to the graveyard and the ministers took care of it and the, and the, maybe the family or friends washed the body, you know, um, there wasn't, you weren't calling up, you know, 1-800-CASKET or anything to get your, to get your casket. So she's right about that. Um, but I think the way she was read was much more these guys are out, out to, you know, steal your money and all that stuff. And, you know, one, one good thing that happened to me with writing my creation book is I got invited to all these uh, funeral director associations because, because of Mitford, there was a lot of uh, regulation after her book, American Way of Death, so that all these state funeral home associations – people have to do all this continuing out. So they have to bring around people like me, you know, to, I mean, mostly like salespeople, like how to sell a casket kind of stuff they do. But, but they were inviting me and these people are lovely. Like I know mm -hmm. in every business, every walk of life, there's, there's crooks. I know that. Um, but in general, like I, I went to dozens of these places. These people are so alive and they're not, um, and they're not making a lot of money. Right. You know, that's like, true. They're just not. Like the whole idea that these mom and pop funeral homes are making so much money on your, your grandpa, it's just not true. And yeah. you know, most of them, most of them who work as funeral directors, they make fifty thousand, sixty thousand, seventy thousand dollars a year. I mean, that's an okay living in a small town, but they're not wealthy. They're they they do not they don't have two boats in their yard and like three mm -hmm. cars and stuff. I mean, it's and also they're on call 24 7 mm -hmm. i mean you, you I, I can't imagine that i know ministers can't imagine that you know but just it's tough and and so um i just think mitford just portrays them in such an unfair light and if you if you read thomas lynch you know the poet undertaker his book the undertaking which i've taught in my in my class to my students i, I mean he's a beautiful book. writer and he really gives you a sense of what they're up to. And most of these people are just trying to dignify death in a culture in which, um, you know, death isn't necessarily as dignified as it used to be. What would your recommendation be for um, my listener who's listening to this right now, who may be an evangelical Christian, 
in um, in a Christian congregation to say, here's how you ought to, if you are concerned about these traditions and these signs of resurrection in the body, here's how you can intentionally go about uh, doing that when it comes to either a planning for your yourself one day or, or also um, dealing with your loved ones. What, what word of recommendation would you give? Well, I, I think um, having conversations about it, first of all, in general, with people who are elderly and who are approaching death, I think it can be wonderful to have conversations with them. Um, in, but I think one way to do that is to talk about, how, you know, what do they want to happen when they die? I know that my parents both wrote their whole, you know, funeral service, basically, like they picked the hymns. I mean, the, they're, they're Episcopalians. Myself. So there, there wasn't a lot of, you know, choosing, you know, I mean, I guess you can choose a different, different, you know, right in the prayer book, but, uh, but they picked their hymns and they, they talked about who they wanted to give eulogies and they talked about whether they wanted to be cremated or buried and, and how, you know, what cemetery plot they should be, should be put in. Um, I think, I think the, um, discussion about cremation versus burial is, is interesting. I think, Maybe more important um, is just the question of whether there's going to be a place, whether the ashes will be buried or not, or whether mm. the, I mean, obviously the body is going to be buried typically. I mean, there are other ways to do this now, but um, I think that is a really important question about whether, whether there's a place for people to memorialize yes. and, and to yes. grieve. Is there yeah. a place you can go? And I know, you know, my, my, my dad um, who passed away four years ago, you know, my mom and I go to his um, his burial uh, site. He was cremated, but um, his ashes were buried, and all of them, by the way, <laughs> weren't. <laughs> we didn't divvy them up. You know, yeah. they were all they were all put in there, and uh, and we had a graveside service uh, in the you know Episcopal you know uh, Book of Common Prayer tradition, and. Uh, now, there are people who don't want to do that, you know, and part of why they don't want to do that is because they're not as attached to the body, right? They just don't think the body really is the person. And so, why are we going there? This is just like some calcium is in the ground underneath here. This isn't dad. This isn't, you know, mom, you know? Yeah. So, I get that. But I think that conversation about the um, the grave site can be really good one. And, and I know we did do some customization there. I mean, we did not put a you know video screen with the greatest hits of my dad's life on the tombstone. But, you know, we found a stone from my backyard that had been dug up that kind of looked like a tombstone and we brought it somewhere to have it carved. And, uh, you know, so we, and you know, my, my mom made choices about the bushes we were going to plant next to it. Cause it's in a cemetery where you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to customize it a little bit. So I think that's, that's an important, that and the burial cremation conversation, but but I think maybe more important is whether there's going to be a, a place that that houses the body, houses the remains of the body in some way. Um, I think that's an important conversation to have. Stephen Prothero, it is always great to talk to you and always enlightening and gives me much to think about. I'll be thinking about the inner Hinduization of American Christianity for a long time after this conversation. So thanks for being with us. Thanks for having me. Thanks, listeners, for listening. Be sure to send this to someone that you think uh, might be interested in it and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. Uh, review and rate uh, the, the show. That helps uh, other people to find us. And if you're listening on a smartphone, you can tap the cover art to have other uh, resources, including a link to the article that we mentioned and where you can get a copy of Professor Prothero's book, uh, Purified by Fire and other books. And be sure while you're there to check out Christianity Today, sign up as a member and and, um, and be with us. You can find out how you can get a trial membership uh, there by clicking on the cover art. This is Russell Moore, and you're listening to the Christianity Today Public Theology Project's Russell Moore Show. The Russell Moore Show is a production of Christianity Today. Eric Petrick is our chief creative officer. Russell Moore is the executive producer and our host. Mike Cosper is our director of podcasts. Administration for CT by Christine Kolb, Pam Vodanova, and Abby Perry. Production assistance by Cormedia, Beth Grabencourt, coordinator. Kevin Duthu, producer and sound mixer. 
Our theme song is Dusty Delta Day by Lennon Hudden. If you like what you heard today, please consider subscribing so you don't miss any future episodes. 